Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to today's program. I am Krista Tippett, and I am so happy to be here um, with the Commonwealth Club of California and really excited to be moderating this program. Um, and I'm pleased to be joined by someone I have long admired, the journalist and lawyer Wajahat Ali, to discuss his new book, Go Back to Where You Came From, and other helpful recommendations on how to become American. Wajahat is an attorney, an author, and a columnist for the Daily Beast. His work has appeared in publications like the New York Times, the Atlantic, and the Washington Post. He is a proud San Francisco Bay Area native and father of three children. And Go Back to Where You Came From describes his journey from being raised in the Bay Area through law school, and becoming a journalist and author and becoming a funny and humble and wise human being. That's, that's my addition <laughs> to the official bio. We're gonna be discussing a lot in the next hour and I'm gonna invite your questions later in the program. So if you're watching along with us right now, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube. And in about 40 minutes, um, I will, we will, we will get to them later in this program. So thank you all for joining. Um, and I wanna start out, I actually, I am trying to get my Zoom here. Well, there you are, Waj. <laughs> I wanna say, I have been calling you Wajahat Ali, but um, I, I have recently realized, I've started calling you Waj. And I, one of the things I learned from the book is that no one calls you by your full name. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well. Unless they're really upset at me. Unless, unless you're my mom. Really That's when I know I've done something wrong because someone says, Wajahat. And I'm like, oh, God. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I think you meant Fareed Zakaria. They're like, no, no, we meant Wajahat Ali. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's also because so many people have called me such amazing. I just yesterday I got Wajajat for the first time. So Wajajat <laughs> right. joins Wahahat. Waja yeah. the Hut and Wajalot as probably the in the pantheon of the, the best uh, mispronunciations of my name. So it was just easier to go by Waj. Yeah, Waj is fine. Let's not punish you with extra syllables. Life's okay. already hard. <laughs> um, you know, since this is us, um, since this is me, um, I feel like the answer to this question is, is kind of um, sprinkled throughout the book. But, but how would you start to talk about the religious or spiritual background of your childhood. Ooh, you're the first person to ask me that question. And I would actually, I always love talking about religion and spirituality. And oftentimes you don't talk about it in a nuanced, meaningful way in America, right? I always joke that like in America, even though it's so fascinating, America is like a deeply religious country for better and for worse, yeah. but we don't cover or talk religion in like a meaningful or smart way. And we just assume religious folks are either like vegans or like red meat eating like carnivores. And I'm like, most of us are omnivores. Uh, you know, it's like a mix and match. And so for me, I was born and raised in the Bay Area, California, like you said, Fremontistan to two Pakistani Muslim immigrant parents. And my parents specifically are Sunni. Uh, about 85% of Muslims around the world are Sunni, 15% Shia, right? So they're Sunni, I think you could say traditional Sunni Muslim parents. And the joke goes that immigrant parents uh, and immigrants in particular, when you come to America, you burn the boat, you assimilate and integrate. My parents couldn't give an F about <laughs> integrating. First of all, they named me Wajahat to blend. And right. then secondly, and you did try to talk your mother out of that, I learned. Or yeah, you well, tried to ask her to rename you at some point. Yeah, I did. Because because when you realize, even though I came from, the, and I'm going to ask you a question, from this family, which kind of celebrated being Muslim and Pakistani and American, and I had the love. Um, and, you know, I didn't speak English until I was five because my parents just couldn't care less about teaching me English. And we had, you know, we fasted during Ramadan and no alcohol in the home you realize you're the other in America oftentimes when you're a kid who goes to school. And in school, usually around the age of five or six, Krista, is when you realize, oh, I'm not the protagonist. And even though I came from this 
this family where it was three generations in one home and had the rich community, the spiritual Muslim community, um, you're like, I, I still want to blend in. No one wants to be the other yeah. <laughs> growing up. And so I remember I was like six years old and I went home. I'm like, mom, mom, I'll let you have the W in the name, but let give me an American name. Why don't we change it? And I didn't say Walter or William. I said Wilbur. And the reason why I chose Wilbur, this this, you know, the, the name that all the ladies love, Wilbur, is because yeah, now aren't you glad now that your mother <laughs> did not she, she literally like said, that. No, your name is Wajat. But you know why I chose Wilbur is because we were reading Charlotte's Web. And who was the hero of that story that everyone loved? Wilbur. So yeah. that's why, thankfully, my mom stuck with Wajahat and gave me many yeah. mispronunciations and stories. But, you know, speaking about religiosity, you know, we grew up in a very Muslim home, right? Which is interesting because my father doesn't have a beard. My mother doesn't wear the hijab. And so when people, even to this day, they like meet my parents and they meet me and they're like, oh, I read you in the New York Times. You seem like a sophisticated person. You've traveled the world. You're telling jokes. Wait, what are you? You're praying. You're not eating pork. You're oh, you're you're pract. Oh, you're one of oh. And they just look at me. You could tell these mental gymnastics that are going in their head because they have another uh, presumption of what a Muslim should be yeah. compared to when they meet me and they realize I've never drank alcohol in my life. I've gone to Hajj. I pray. I try to do the early prayer. It's hella early though, so sometimes I miss it. You know, and and I and religion plays an active part in my in my in my in just my being and the funny thing is is i literally was told this by liberals even in new york i get i get told this often we didn't know muslims could be funny and i remember one agent one time i said what did you think muslims really? were like really? yeah i swear to god this is an exact story that happened in new york there was a literary <laughs> agent educated brown university really nice guy and he said yeah. i read an essay of yours i didn't know muslims could be funny i'm like why did you think that i wasn't even upset i said why did you think that and he goes yeah why did i think that well it's because muslims and he made this face and I'm like constipated. He goes, no, they're just very serious. And so yeah. that's how I've navigated, you know, a very, I'm, I'm, I'm a very, this is the funny thing. People say you look very progressive in your politics and I get hit with Muslims. The funny thing is, is if you actually met me in my private life, I am a very traditional Pakistani Muslim uncle. The irony, we exist. <laughs> so, you know, you're so much of this book is about, um, identity and and what we do with that in America um, on so many levels and and you know you and I first I first came across you um, in those years after September 11th and you know it's very much again woven through the story you tell of how being Muslim in this culture also, shifted how you how you personally and have been affected by being in a post 9-11 world and you know I think so often about how there's so many repercussions of 9-11 mm. um, in terms of how this country reacted to it right what our reaction was to it both oh, yeah. internationally and domestically that have so shaped the world um, and it's there kind of in your story, it's intimate and it's civilizational. Um, and you, you know, right. so I, okay, I had not heard this idea that Muslims can't be funny, but one of the things you talk about is this trope of the moderate Muslim, which really just means the reasonable Muslim, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of connotations and what people mean by that, um, and how problematic that is. Um, so say a little bit about that, because I think it's also such a bland, meaningless word, moderate. And, you know, one thing I would say that you for me embody is it's also not, it's not the same thing as being secular, yeah, um, that's but right. it's a very simplifying phrase. It's a flattening phrase. It's the yogurt of adjectives, right? It's not even like the fancy yogurt. <laughs> exactly. It's just like yeah. the cheap plain, yogurt. Plain yogurt, low yeah, fat. The, the low fat plain yogurt <laughs> that no one wants. And it's like your mom uses for like anything else other than yogurt. That's what happens in immigrant right. families. Like when there's a yogurt box, you realize there's anything other than yogurt in that box. It's like all the leftovers. And so yeah. the modern Muslim stereotype, which is very painful uh, and, and very insulting, mm -hmm. it assumes that the majority of us, there's 1.8 billion Muslims, 1400 years of Islamic civilization, 4 million Muslims. Muslims have been in this country since its founding. Up to 30% of the Muslims that were brought here forcibly against their will from Africa were Muslim. So if you really think about it, it's very profound. Muslim blood, 
labor, sweat, pain, joy, fertilizes country soil. But after 9-11, there becomes a shift in the timeline. There's always a pre-9-11 Krista and a post-9-11. And for my generation, I was a 20-year-old undeclared senior at UC Berkeley trying to figure out what to do with the rest of my life. I was a member of the Muslim Student Association. The two towers fall and all of a sudden, tag, you're it. You're no longer American. You're them. You're us and them. Your citizen and suspect. And this story in America has happened time and time again. It's like a remake. Every 10 years, there's a new villain. It was the Japanese Americans. It was the Chinese Americans. It's again, Asian Americans right now in the past year with the COVID, right? It's always been African Americans, Latinos. But for us, we were given this fantasy that you were the model minority. You were the good Asians. You were the ones that we elevated. You work hard. You pull yourself up from your bootstraps. You don't complain. You smile away your problems. And in in exchange, there's a Faustian bargain. We'll accept you, oh, model minority, uh, in exchange for your silence, complicity, and invisibility. Just get the good job. Get the good degree. Go to the good suburbs and keep your mouth shut. You'll be vice president. You'll never be president. You'll be a sidekick. You won't be the protagonist. Just be happy. And so you internalize this, and then 9-11 happens. And you realize overnight that no matter how much we chased whiteness, I'm not talking about white people. I'm taking, talking yeah. about whiteness. Yeah. Overnight, this country turns on you. And that's what happened. And it wasn't just Muslims, Krista. I want everyone to remember, this is how stupid bigotry is. It's vicious, but it's also stupid. Bigots aren't nuanced. Bigots aren't like, excuse me, are you a Sunni Muslim? Uh, oh, 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 you're not? Oh, okay, fine. Uh, they're like, oh, you're a brown-skinned person who has a beard. I'm going to go kill you. The first hate crime after 9-11 was against a sick man in Arizona, 19 foreign hijackers brought down the two towers. A sick man in Arizona paid the price. So for us overnight, all of a sudden, as a 20-year-old, you have no training. There's not too many of us out there in public at that time. There's not You don't see us on the radio or on TV. You don't see any books. No one sat there and said, Wajah, these are the talking points. All you know is intimately, now we're getting hazed to the point where even Muslim women born and raised in this country wearing hijab were scared to come to campus that day. Yeah. I'm getting hate mail that day asking me why I brought down the towers. I'm like, I'm 20 years old. My family's from Pakistan. What? And so you become us and them. And the narrative, Krista, of Wajahatli was not the narrative of Wajahatli. I became Osama. I became Saddam. And since that time, I would say fast forward 21 did years. Did people really say it was that language? Oh, the, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. All the time. Why did you folks bring it down? Go F yourself. Get out of my country. You and Osama, been, you know, a lot of stuff I can't say on public radio, right? Like the mm-hmm. day that happened. That's when I started getting the hate mail. And I started getting the hate mail because my roommate decides to put my email on the, on the uh, contact one. So I get all this love. Okay. So the moderate Muslim myth was the following. Where are the moderate Muslims? Right. How come they haven't condemned terrorism? And let me just explain very quickly the double standard. When there is a violent act, why do people of color in this country often pray that the suspect is a white person? Not because we want anything to happen against white people. It's because we know that if the suspect is a white person, white people will be saved. Krista Tippett will not be asked to condemn a violent act done by a violent person she's never met. Krista Tippett's whiteness will not be interrogated. Krista Tippett will not be the ambassador of white Western civilization. But for us, for the past two decades, Anytime something, I mean, I'll take you, let's go back to last month in Texas when this Pakistani Muslim guy from Britain that we don't know uh, held the Texas synagogue hospital. Oh, yeah. All of a sudden, Wajahat, you're a terrorist sympathizer. Why? Because I'm Muslim and I retweeted an article 10 years ago written by someone else. That's it. And so that's why the moderate Muslim was so punishing. It flattened us. It made us into suspects. And the assumption of the question, Krista, is mm-hmm. that if you don't proactively and retroactively condemn violent acts done by people you've never met, you somehow are what? Condoning it. And the only good Muslim is the Muslim fighting ISIS. And I'm like, what about the lazy Muslim who watches Netflix? Right. <laughs> you know, or eats right. Cheetos. Or, or, you say, or if you don't, as you say, I mean, I think the way you said it is so helpful. Um, if you don't condemn it, you are like that, right? That's right. You, you, it's almost like the burden of proof is on you to distinguish yourself. That's exactly it. And, and you'll never win. That's the thing. The burden of the proof is so high. No, no matter how much evidence you marshal, no matter how eloquent you are, no matter how much you prove your civilizational worth, you feel like the jury's rigged. <laughs> like you'll always be sentenced. So it's like what Toni Morrison said about racism. No matter how much you prove it, it's never enough. And it's always exhausting. Mm-hmm. I mean, something that's also... Um, fascinating about your story um, and just how you're, 
you're you're choosing to bring it forward in this book um, as an examination of your life, but as an examination of our culture as well, mm. um, is that um, you talk about growing up um, if you had if you had multiple choice questions to answer about race, right, or identity as that you know that might have been the identity question. There was basically like white and there was other. <laughs> And, yeah. and that you uh, other from... I call uh, I call other the hot dog of the census. <laughs> the hot dog of what? The hot dog of the census, right? The hot dog of the 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 box that right. you check. Yeah. So so you so in your lifetime you've moved from that from having that hot dog choice <laughs> that completely amorphous, just not white, right? Um, and even that is very complicated to define or pin down to now late in life experiencing what do you write becoming what diversity and outreach coordinators refer to as a muslim man of color yeah um, bipoc i'm a we're apparently a me- member of bipoc and bipoc is a new term relatively new term which is black yeah. indigenous people of color and i'm the poc of bipoc yeah. and so now i'm a muslim man of color and bipoc to, i don't know i don't know about anyone else listening but bipoc to me if someone says bipoc i feel like a robot like released by Skynet, sent to like kill humanity, <laughs> or or like like I say in the book, it's like a sleep apnea machine. But apparently, I'm POC of BIPOC now, Chris. I'm no longer other. I have evolved. I just think, in the context of your story, you know, these are serious things that are happening. The way we're reckoning with identity, and we're diversifying, and we're trying to expand imaginations and be and honor um, particularity. Um, but for you, kind of first of all, having had this existential shift as a Muslim after 9-11, and now um, having this really interesting uh, angle on on some of these other identity shifts we're making. Um, I, f- I found that really one of the very interesting things. I wonder if just writing this book, because I think writing often is a way that we actually learn what we're thinking. Mm-hmm. I wonder if writing the book was a way for you to kind of examine your reactions to some of this. Yeah, well, no, it's uh, the process of writing, right? forces mm-hmm. you to formulate these thoughts into a coherent narrative and forces you to ruminate uh, and forces you to examine these issues in a deeper level, uh, both within yourself and at a macro level. And I appreciate you mentioned that. Like, it's a very culturally specific tale told um, about America, right? It's like a universe. The universal oftentimes is uh, told through the specific. And so I went both very intimate and I used the intimate story as kind of a connect the dot history of America of the past 20, 30 years. Like, how did we get to Donald Trump, right? Uh, is xenophobia a new phenomenon or has it been happening for a while? What is this thing called whiteness? And, you know, many people, how do you love a country that doesn't love you back? Um, how do you love a country that treats you as a suspect? You know, we've read a lot of elegies. Well, what, where is the elegy for the rest of us? And so, it, you know, these things that you grow up with, these things that you internalize, these things that you experience, and so many of us experience, the writer's job then sometimes, or maybe the writer's burden or gift or privilege, is that they are able to vocalize it into a sentiment and into a narrative that gives life to these feelings through mm-hmm. words. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the, a nice little compliment I've received, the book's been out for like now four weeks, is so many people say, you have articulated my emotions and my frustrations that I was not able to articulate right. in, in a narrative form. Thank you. And so, yeah, these are some of the things that you, and, and what's interesting also, it's what's common to you is not common to other people. And so the book begins, and I tried to experiment with the book, not just to have a boring, um, I don't want to say boring, but I, didn't, I wanted to mix it up with the structure. I didn't want to do like a once upon a time type of narrative. I begin with hate mail because right out of the <laughs> gate, you know, it's like- I wasn't quite sure what I was reading. I have to yeah, say it's like a jarring I people like what's about. happening, right? Because, yeah. you know, it's one of those books where like, it's one of those walk in my shoes type of books. But I'm like, all right, if you want to walk in my shoes, let's open the inbox. Okay, and are those journey. real- Real messages? Every single one is real. Okay, so I have to say, I I shouldn't be shocked, but I am I am shocked. And, my, and, and that's the funny thing is, I wasn't shocked. I was shocked by how many people were shocked, and then yeah. so many Americans, fellow Americans, like, wow, I don't know. I, how do you deal with that? I'm so sorry. Mm-hmm. Every day, go back to where you came from. Go f a goat or a camel. I'm like, why only goats and camels? You know, you're trying to replace our civilization. You people, I'm like left-handed people. And the way I respond in the book is my response in life and is my response to those emails is I joke that oftentimes people of color, you get exhausted, you get burdened, you get drained and you respond like Daffy Duck. 
And if you ever watch those cartoons, Young Bucks, go Google it. Uh, the anvil always drops on Daffy Duck's head. But I want to respond like Bugs Bunny. And people forget Bugs Bunny was always chased by Yosemite Sam. Like if you go back and watch those cartoons, like Bugs Bunny is always just trying to live his life. Like many people of color, they're just trying to live their life. But Yosemite Sam always chases them and Elmer Fudd chases them. And so what he does is he responds, but he responds in a way where they fall down in their own traps they made for him. He gives them a kiss. And at the end of the episode, he has the last laugh, the last word, and he eats the carrot. And in this book, I wanted us to have the last laugh and the last word. Hmm. You know, this isn't a funny part, but I found it very moving. And it's also another example of you kind of playing with form. Um, there's a, it's page 102, I wrote down, where you, is it, it, you, you, just, you talk about reflecting on um, the fact that since the 9-11 attacks, you do not feel safe praying openly mm. um, in your country, which as you say, by every analysis compared to many other countries um, is one of the most religious places um, on earth. Um, and you also just made a list, a long list of places <laughs> in the world, all over the world where you had prayed when it was time in your day as a Muslim um, for prayer. I think yeah, in the list was Alcatraz Island, Empire State, uh, every single movie theater in the Bay Area, yeah. fast food restaurants, UC Berkeley, right? Gap stalls. And, and what I mentioned was, and that's the tension, right? Like people say, oh, but Muslims are crushing it now. Look at you, Wajah. You're talking to Krista Tippett for Commonwealth. Look at Hassan Minaj. Look at Mehdi Hassan. Look at Miss Marvel. Look at the poll numbers. The Democratic Party is like, uh, uh, you know, embracing you. I said, correct. At the same time, Never in my life growing up did I have the mainstreaming of anti-Muslim bigotry where one president of the country and one member leader of one of the political parties literally said Islam hates us and there's a Muslim man and Islamophobia is so open that it's just commonly accepted by one of the major political parties. Like this is brand new territory. And you saw the shift after 9-11. It's not that I'm afraid to pray or afraid to be who I am, but I'll give you an example. Like even after 9-11, even after 9-11 at UC Berkeley, right? And maybe because it was California, but I don't think so. Because like, like I said, I made the list of places we prayed. If there was like a bunch of us brown guys and we had to pray, you know, we'd go into a quiet place publicly and we just pray. And people are like, they're doing Arabic Tai Chi. That's interesting. Why are they stretching? And we'd kind of, you know, you get some eyeballs and, but it's a, no one would bother us. But I've talked to a lot of Muslims where it's now it's like, I just don't feel that level of, even the airport we used to pray, like go in the corner, sometimes pray. But now you're like, should I walk 27 minutes to the prayer room, the meditation room in the airport, miss my flight? Should I do it in the, in the, in the, in the plane? If I do it here, is it worth it? There is a tension, Krista, a tension where many of us are like, is it worth it? Is it worth it to make you a target? And that's even the feeling of that tension that I get is something that I did not have in 2001. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it makes me it makes me so sad too. Um, you you're such a passionate father, and just knowing that um, you you had that that had that experience of the before and the after. Not that it was perfect in the before, mm -hmm. but it was different. You didn't it's have different. this particular burden, and um, that must weigh on you. Um, that your children. I mean, do you have to talk to them about that? Is or they? I don't know. You know, yeah. We, we so this is this. Let me tell you how things have changed and how you internalize um, being an other in this country. I'll give you one example. A couple of years ago, in Virginia, I'm I'm originally from the Bay Area. I moved to Virginia because I married up, <laughs> I married way up, so I moved for my wife. But you know, we're at that age now where friends are having babies and getting married. And at that time, we were married. We didn't have kids. But a, a friend of ours was about to have. She was pregnant. She was about to have a kid. And so she said very casually you know, what should I name him? And other folks are like, well, they gave names. And she goes, yeah, but I want to give a name, which is a Muslim name, but which is also, you know, kind of mainstream to the point where not because she was ashamed, because she goes, I, he's going to be a brown skinned kid, a Muslim kid, and I don't want him teased in school. And so with, and I paused the conversation. I'm like, guys, do you realize what's happening? We're policing our own unborn children's name yeah. just to give them a leg up so they will survive in a country that we were born in. This is not normal. Mm -hmm. And look at me. My parents couldn't care less. They named me Wajahat, right? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> you know, they couldn't care yeah. less. But, you know, this type of 
policing of the name, like Adam. Adam becomes Adam. Layla, white American, because American, usually average American in this country does a heavy lifting for white American, just like mainstream, just like Rust Belt, just like, you know, a blue collar, right? So it's like, what will mainstream thing? Adam, Layla, Sophia. And it just made me sad that we have to, we feel like we have to police and censor our children's name for their safety. Mm. That's something new. Not yeah. everyone does this, of course, but the fact that some people are having a conversation, not that they're sellouts, they're parents. And you're a parent, I'm a parent. Well, at the end of the day, what do you want? You want to just protect your child. Yeah. That's a post 9-11 reality. Yeah. Um, this was a pre-9-11, but I did, I did find it um, amusing to read your story of attending your all boys Jesuit Catholic school in the Bay area. And what a great disappointment you were to father a lender <laughs> for having the highest grades in the class. <laughs> I went to an all, I went to Bellarmine. In your name, yeah. Ali, that no, was followed by the Hindu Kalyan Neelam Raju followed <laughs> by the lapsed Persian Muslim Navid Mustafavi. So we went to all boys <laughs> Jesuit Catholic high school, Bellarmine in San Jose. And for anyone who's gone to all boys Catholic school or all girls Catholic school, like <laughs> What they're trying to do without telling you is like maybe they want you to convert you and like make you a Jesuit priest. So like every semester, there's like a Trojan horse class, like Bible as literature, social justice from a Christian angle, Christian morality. And so I read the Bible for the first time. And like I said, going back to your first question, the spiritual religious upbringing, I'm a Muslim. And so when I read the Bible for the first time, like these stories are the stories in the Bible. I know these prophets, but from a little bit of, you know, same I really got into it. I'm like, same morals, same ethics. And like, I crushed Krista. So every at the end of the semester, I crushed, like I knew Bible verse. I used to like, right. the, your father and there's like, anyone, did anyone read what I said? Any, anyone other than Wajahad? Anyone other than Wajahad? And like, they're like, fine, Wajahad. And I'm just like, <laughs> like, well, what Jesus said to the disciples and everyone's like, you know, I got extra credit for my team and my, and my team, all Catholics are like, good job, watch. And I'm like, this should, this should be like a sitcom. Um, and, and like, so yeah, they used to read the like, highest grades and the highest grade. Every, I just crushed every year for four years. And yeah. I could just, I could hear the Jesuit hearts cracking of the teachers, like a little, <laughs> a little tear. <laughs> like, the Muslim, of course, crushes it. So let's just say, to put it mildly, um, you've had an interesting family story. Yeah. <laughs> There, there's a eventual. lot of there's a lot of drama there. Um, there's a lot of material for um, tragedy and comedy. Mm. Such um, is life. Such is life. Such is life. But I feel like you really let it all hang out in the book. And I and I, you know, there's so many um, chapters and dynamics. Um, you know, your, your parents kind of really achieving the American dream and then, and then, and then losing it in this very dramatic, I mean, you know, just having a very dramatic story. Um, you kind of tell the truth about uh, an experience. I think so many of us have had of looking like we're succeeding and really, well, we're just barely hanging on. And yeah. um, you had a near death experience. Um, a couple. A couple. And I, I had a feeling that you, I mean, I don't have a feeling. I think it's, it was clear that you're, 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 t- and you, and you also, yeah, that you, that you're sharing these things because you think it's important that we, that we tell these truths. That's right. You know what? In in the book, you'll find out that you know we had the, both the American dream and the American nightmare. I have a very unique perspective into America because I've seen both extremes and I've lived both extremes, oftentimes at the same time. You know, you grow up in the model minority myth. It's a myth. Suburban kid whose immigrant parents work hard and have grit and pull themselves up and become middle class and upper middle class. And you go to the good schools and then my parents get arrested. And then almost for a decade, they are part of the criminal justice system and they appeal their case. And overnight, we lose everything. We lose our money, our homes, our reputations, our community, our friends. It's blasted all over the headlines. The lived experience and complexity of this family becomes immediately flattened, Krista with two lines of a headline. That's how it works. And you and you realize, oh, we're closer to blackness now. Oh, we're living the America of millions of Americans who are poor and part of the criminal justice system. What will people say? And lo kya bolenge and lo kya kenge is Urdu for what will people say? It's in every culture, mm-hmm. especially immigrant cultures. Right. Right. And all of us are ethnic. And yeah. it's all about, you have to save your face. You have to, don't cut your nose. 
You have to smile with your white teeth showing and smile away the pain. You suffer silently. People will judge you otherwise. So even if you're having a divorce, you have a good marriage. Smile and go to the party. Even if your daughter is suicidal, your daughter's doing fine. There's no mental health issues. We're not that type of family. We're not like the Patels or the Khans. We're the Ali's or the, the Tippets. If you have a financial a pain and suffering, you're in the Bay Area. You have to keep up with the Jones. So you just buy stuff you, you can't afford and you drown with debt and you take like Ativan and you, and you suffer quietly and you smile quietly because you've achieved the American dream. And God forbid, if you reveal the pain, the sorrow, the sadness, you are weak, you are a failure, people will judge you. So instead, it's better to live a fiction. And there is a cost and a consequence to living the fiction, Krista. You never air the dirty laundry so that laundry never gets cleaned. The demons never get exercised. The yeah. wounds never get healed. Right. Uh, and the pain gets passed on from generation to generation. And so, in the, like you said, in this book, I'm like, if I do this book this way, I have to go all out and talk about things I haven't shared publicly, which includes my parents' incarceration, being yeah. homeless, you know, mental health. And, you know, the only thing I was never embarrassed by it, even while, while going through it, the only thing that gave me pause is the following. You know, they always say memoir is a type of theft because it's your version of the story and it's populated with real life characters, right? So, I got my parents' permission and, and you know, now it's enough time that, that I'm like, okay, we can share the story. And they read it and they said, please be as honest as possible. But I'm like, will they suffer again? Will they be humiliated? Will people use them as a punchline? That was my only concern mm -hmm. uh, because people were, I, I showed in the book how communities can build you and communities can break you down. Communities can be kind and communities can be vicious, yeah. as I mentioned in the book. But what I've seen instead is it's been remarkable in the past month. I've gotten so many emails and messages no one's mocked them or mocked my family. They said, wow, you never know what people are going through. And this is what they also say. Yeah. I've gone through this. And seeing how your story has been embraced gives me strength that maybe I can share my story. Mm -hmm. I'm not alone. And everyone at the end of the day just wants to belong, be loved, and have a community. You, you also talk about your um, OCD. And my, my daughter... Um, has struggled with OCD, but what I'd also say is it's, um, you know, it's part of what makes her who she is and in her, her extraordinary self. And I appreciated you also. How old is your daughter? She's 28. You can, can I ask when did she get diagnosed? Or when did she realize? Um, you know, it, I, it's probably won't surprise you that looking back, I, I see, I see it, um, mm -hmm. you're, you know, many years before, but she was so high functioning and, you know, she's such a, an interesting person, but it really, for her became paralyzing when she went to college. Yeah. So she was about 20, it really became a crisis um, when she was about 20. And then she's done so much. She knows herself so much better at this age than I did, in, you know, in, into my forties. And, and, you know, for me, it was also right when I got to college where it spiked. And my mind was always like that. It just used to get stuck. And for those of you who don't know, OCD is an, is an anxiety disorder. There is a genetic component to it. And it's not like a weakness of character. It's just that there's an electrical misfiring in our brain. And we have all the same thoughts that you have. But if you had the same misfiring that we did, you would behave exactly the same way. And the trick about OCD, why it's so punishing, is logically and rationally, we know that our responses to these thoughts, this flood of anxiety is irrational. We know that's the worst part. Like we know this is irrational, but you get so overwhelmed with your fight flight system. They're like, I, ha I have to escape. So what you do is you do compulsions. Sometimes this comes as like counting prayers, numbers, and then you get addicted to the compulsions because your body says, oh, that compulsion helped me last, last time. So it becomes a cycle. And, and you feel like you can't share this with anyone because you're a high functioning quote unquote normal person. And if you told people what your thought, what you were thinking and what you were doing, they'll, they'd laugh at you and mock it, mock you. So the other two uh, fuels to the fire are shame and guilt within people who suffer from OCD. And then you throw in Krista, the immigrant communities where only the weak people go to therapy because you're supposed to wait for it, pray it away. It's a sign of you being spiritually weak. We came to this country and you saw us pull ourselves from the bootstrap. Only those privileged whites and Woody Allen go to therapy, work harder, pray more. How dare are you depressed? Like we don't even talk about these things. And so that adds more guilt and shame. And so I was very lucky, very lucky that my parents, 
instead of being ashamed, they took me to a therapist who like, I thought they were telling me I was crazy. Cause I'm like, this is how my brain works. This is what's happening. And the funny thing is, is the, like you said, your, your daughter was high functioning. The pain is internal. Externally, people are like, this person's killing it. This person's so calm. Exactly. This person's, a, yeah. this person's, I want to be like this person. The irony was that people put me in leadership positions, Krista, because it said, this guy mm-hmm. is high functioning in crisis. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, I'd be sitting there entertaining people, but it just melting mm-hmm. down in my mind. And then, you know, this therapist listened to me for like 30 seconds. He goes, oh, you just have OCD. I'm like, what? And that process of self-discovery of learning about yourself, of knowing yourself and how my mind works was so liberating. And so even talking about OCD, going back to the last question, by sharing it in the book and in an article I wrote for the New York Times and talking about it, perhaps one of the most profound exchanges I've had with audiences, because I still get emails to this day, where not just people who suffer from OCD, but their relatives, like parents, like you say, I yeah. now understand my kid. Yeah. Now I'm like, wow, look at that. You know, you never, you never, you sit there and you think I didn't become a doctor. <laughs> you know, I'm a writer. Am I helping anyone? Also your mother, your yeah, yeah. mother yeah, my mom. wouldn't rename you and also really wanted you to be a doctor. <laughs> she said, have insurance. My mom always said, have insurance. She goes, yeah. you know, be a writer, but you first become a doctor. But like, you know, you sit there and think, huh, maybe these stories matter mm-hmm. because it gives comfort to someone out there. You never know who's like, oh, this is how my brain works. Yeah. Or now I understand my partner or my kid. And that was, that's really lovely. So, you know, you mentioned how religion, um, uh, and also I just think, uh, communities, you know, one's community, which can be a religious community, an ethnic community, a geologic, you know, ge- geographic community, but can be problematic with, um, at these hard places. Right. But I also, um, really sense that for you and i mean i just want to ask you that that for you also islam um is is such a an important and nourishing and profound part of your life Mm. and um and i and i just want to ask you kind of what is it talk to us a little bit about the teachings the um the rituals the practices um of Islam that also accompany you in a, in a generative way, as you, as you kind of lay out the truth of life and all of its contradictions and its hard edges. You know, you can replace Muslims. Well, what I'm about to say, you can replace Muslims with any religious community. And I say like, God is merciful, but often Muslims are not. <laughs> God is kindness, but often Muslims are not kind. And some people say, I'm glad I found God before I found Muslims. Uh, which shows you the contradiction, right? Where we have this thirst and yearning for a higher power and meaning in the spiritual tradition, which is so rich within all our traditions that goes back thousands of years. And then you see these data points that come out. You know this, Krista, you've done multiple shows on this. The nuns are growing, the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Yeah. You know, people are leaving relig- Christian at Christianity and Judaism and Orthodoxy. And oh my God, the crisis. And when you dig deeper, it's not that they're leaving religion and spirituality they're leaving behind these communities that have been so toxic to them. They're leaving behind these communities that have almost operated like businesses uh, where only a few people get the say and they have the conch and they use religion, not as a shield, but as a sword. Right. And and they feel like I I don't find self-worth here. I don't find dignity. I don't find love. I, I don't even find spirituality. I have to find something else. And that's, what's interesting It's not that they've left, they're searching. They're searching for something. That's the key thing. And so I have had that love-hate relationship with my community that has turned on me multiple times in my life. Right? It turned on me when my parents went to jail. It was after 9-11. And you know, it was one of the situations. Huge sensationalistic case, front page of the FBI, post-9-11 climate. Everyone was terrified. My parents also, on a micro level, were one of the first ones to make it. And there's something about human nature that you love seeing powerful or wealthy people get crushed, right? And then you love rebuilding them. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the duality, right? The people who are stomping on you are often the ones who also then throw in the white towel. And for me, I've had this love-hate relationship with the community, I guess you could say, but I, I always joke that no matter how hard I've tried to leave Islam, like I'm a lifer. Like it's just part of my DNA. Like, how, you know, some people are like, I've tried to leave the faith or any faith. And like, I just feel like it's, I've always been geared towards it. 
align towards it. And even in college, I remember I told my parents, I said, I know you guys have raised me Muslim and you did the Sunday school and the Quran, but like, I have to find answers for myself. And on this journey, if it, if I find out that Islam is not the truth for me, the truth, which is always relative or religion is not the truth for me, I'm going to leave. And they're like, okay, well go, we taught you what we taught you. And I just remember I came to it then on my own and I found a spiritual path on my own and it sustains and nourishes me because on a very selfish level, life for me is better with God in it. Hmm. All right. And the, uh, the story of life, of life with a nurturing, loving God is a better story for me. And in that near-death experience that I mentioned in the book, and I talk about this in those final yeah. moments. Say a little uh, bit more about that. Tell it, just share a little bit about 10 that. years ago, I'm a healthy kid, but at, at 30, about just turned 31. And I go to 24 hour fitness and I'm going to do the lame workout because I have 30 minutes. So I'm going to do 30 minutes on the elliptical just to get a little sweat. And I get on the elliptical and immediately my heart rate races because I had a heart condition at that time. And I'm like, I'm going to pass out. This has happened before a couple of times in my life. I pass out. My heart rate has still not subsided. Usually when you pass out, there's a reset. Everyone's terrified. They rush me to Washington Hospital across the street. My heart rate's at 230, 240. Yeah. Resting heart rate, ladies and gentlemen, should be at 60 to 100. My heart rate stays at 230, 220, 215, 220 for like 45 minutes. Not good. They pump me full of drugs. They defibrillate me three times called cardioversion, three, two, one, clear. A one cardioversion is supposed to shock your heart back to normalcy. Nope. Now I'm having congestive heart failure at the age of 31. Everyone's freaking out. I don't take drugs. I don't drink. I'm, you know, I work out. But I think what happened, uh, Krista, was just like I had an electrical misfiring of a brain. I had a heart condition called supraventricular tachycardia, but also the 10 years of stress that I went through in my 20s with my parents in jail, I think caught up with me, to be honest. You know, you could feel it in your bones. Mm -hmm. And so your body just knows. That's all I can say. Anyone's gone through a near-death experience. Your body just knows. You don't have to look at the charts. I don't have to look at the terrified faces of the nurses who are terrified. When the nurses are more terrified than you, uh, you know you're in a bad situation. That's right, yeah. yeah. And you're like, when, you're, when your doctor's like, holy crap, I'm like, that's not good. Uh, and so I just knew, you know, I'm like coughing up phlegm, I have pulmonary edema. And, and, and I talk about in the book, the, the phases of going through a near-death experience, which I won't share for the interest of time, but you go through an audit of your life, you pinpoint moments, you, you then make a negotiation with God, you do a barter system, and then you realize time's up. And in those final moments, and maybe this is me being selfish. Maybe this is why, you know, I still believe in God and it sustains me is life is hard. We all die. We each owe a death. We all have challenges and pain, but sometimes faith and spirituality, if it can make you a better person, if it give you hope, if it can give you balance, and if it could give you the sense of comfort at the end, because I'm telling you at the end, Krista, what finally gave me a piece of comfort, like when I let go, I let go. I was like, I'm at peace because I had a feeling that on the other side, there would be a loving God that would embrace me. And that feeling or that delusion or that crutch was enough for me to let go and have peace. And right when that happened, uh, and another epiphany happened that I mentioned in the book, that I, might, I should have gone married. <laughs> I'm dying alone. I probably should invest in a family. My heart rate stabilized. And then, you know, I know people are all into signs. I'm thinking that was a clear sign. <laughs> <laughs> and then you proceeded, it proceeded to happen. Less than a year later, I got married. Yeah. Okay. So there are a lot of questions and we, we, we have about, I, we don't have time for all of them. I won't be garrulous. I, I, I'll keep it tight. I promise. Sorry. Oh, no, no. I just, I, I would like to keep, I would, I'm, I'm so enjoying this, but I want to, I want to turn to everybody else. Um, here's a simple question. Maybe do you enjoy the give and take on Twitter? Uh, yes, sometimes I do. I try not to waste my time because if you, if you respond to every hateful comment, you will drown in it. And it's also toxic. And I'll also tell people this, you don't have to accept every fight you're invited to. And the second advice, if you don't mind me giving you is ignoring is a response. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, here's a question about, uh, place, I think Bay area, which does figure large for you. Um, can you share any special memories of growing up in the Bay area? Anything you miss about living here? 
Yeah, I mean, look, I was born and raised in the Bay. And like I mentioned in the book, you know, you're 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 always romantic about your first love, even if it breaks your heart. And Bay Area did break my heart, but it also forged me. It made me. I was there till I was 31, born and raised in the Bay. I think El Camino Hospital. And then like they, we moved from Milpitas to Fremont right when I was born, stay in the house for like 15 years, bounce around Fremont, do the chaos of the next 16 years. Uh, went to UC, went to uh, James Leach, Harker, Bellarmine, UC Berkeley, UC Davis. Uh, was stuck in the Bay because I was helping my grandparents, uh, my grandmother specifically, right? I stayed with her until she passed while my parents were in jail. And then while my wife and I were married, we lived apart for six months because I was taking care of my grandmother until she passed away, right? So, you know, got my first car in the, in the Bay Area. You know, you got your, you know, uh, met my wife in the Bay Area, even though she then moved to DC, right? Like, I, that's that's my home. It's, it'll always be part of my home. And I remember you want to bring it full circle. Why things like this, like this, I don't take for granted is first of all, I'm alive, which is amazing. I, I never take any of this for granted. The fact that all of us are alive during a pandemic where 5 million people have died is a gift. The fact that we have a breath is a privilege. I don't take this for granted at all. And if you read the book and as Krista is alluding to all of the interesting adventures I've been on, <laughs> the fact that I'm here talking to Krista is amazing. Uh, and the fact that I'm talking <laughs> at an event sponsored by Commonwealth, because if you want to talk about memories i'll give you two uh, a couple of weeks ago i was doing an event with dave eggers for city arts unfortunately we had to cancel it due to omicron mm -hmm. i used to go to city arts lectures and i sat there as a late in my late 20s thinking you know maybe this is wild i mean i'm broke my parents are going through this case i mean my credit's shot to hell maybe one day i'll write something and they'll invite me to be an author ah who knows and then you know I'm talking to Dave Eggers for City Arts. Commonwealth, same thing. You know, I got invited as a guest because I wasn't bougie bougie like the others, right? But then I'm like, maybe one day they'll invite me to talk in my, my book. Wouldn't that be wild? That would be wild because I used to go. I went there. I know exactly where the Commonwealth um, offices were in the San Francisco, right? And, and the fact that this is happening now is not lost upon me. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been very I'm very grateful. The emotion people say, what's the emotion you feel? Pride. Do you feel confidence? I'm no, I just gratitude. I'm like, you know, the fact that this is happening is, is wild. Uh, especially if you read the book and you realize where I was at that time, uh, mm -hmm. that this is happening right now. And the fact that I'm a barrier kid going to these barrier institutions and they have been so respectful to me and proactively invited me is something that I'm very grateful for. It's very humbling. Mm -hmm. Um. Another question, as you look ahead to the next election, mm. um, are you scared, hopeful, somewhere in between? Uh, I'm a realist and a pragmatist, but I'm not a, uh, uh, I'm not, um, a nihilist. Uh, and so the, I've said this before, and I'll say it again, and I'll quickly explain it. I feel like we're dealing with the death rattle of white supremacy, which has transformed into a death march. Not white people, I'm talking about white supremacy, an ideology, a system, a structure that has to elevate what they consider whiteness above all else. And if you don't believe me, look at how some people in this country, some elected leaders are responding to what's happening in Ukraine right now. Our prayers should be with Ukrainians right now. We don't know what's happening, what's, what's going to happen. Kiv might fall. Uh, they're brave. Uh, they're innocent and they're fleeing their country. And some of them are fighting based off uh, uh, an illegal barbaric invasion by Putin. And you see people in this country right now Donald Trump, who's still the figurehead of the right-wing movement and the Republican Party, you're seeing some elected officials, you're seeing Steve Bannon rooting for Vladimir Putin. And the reason for that is, some people say it's the money. Yes, Russia has pumped a lot of money. Some people say it's to hit Biden, make him look weak. Yes, it's political, but it's also ideological. And there's a white Christian nationalism. There was a, there was a report that came out just two weeks ago. I recommend everyone uh, read a 60-page report that talked about the influence of white Christian nationalism on the January 6th violent insurrection, the ideology, the symbols, the language. And I'm not talking about all white folks and all Christians. I, I want to be clear. It's white Christian nationalism is part of a political movement, which is now fused with the right wing and, and part and parcel of white supremacy since the beginning. They're playing for all the marbles. And so the reason why I'm worried is in the next midterms, it seems most likely Democrats are going to lose. And in 2024, you know, with voter suppression, with, with disinformation, with the economy and inflation, if you lose and you get not Trump, but someone who's Trump-esque, you're witnessing what I see is what was once the fringe become the mainstream. And you're going to see 
a reshaping not just of America, but of the post-World War II global order, where United States, instead of standing with NATO and EU, is going to stand with Russia and Hungary and Poland and right-wing governments, and maybe it's still in Brazil, India, and other places. So that's why this is a pivotal election. And it's a pivotal election, which I'm really worried about the future of America, because we are looking at minority rule based on, you know, the electoral college based on just, you know, you know how it goes. And so that's something where I still don't think Krista people are recognizing what we're dealing with. I take people literally and seriously. I've studied this like a very helpful bond villain. They're literally telling you their plot and their plan. And, you know, this country as a multiracial democracy, Krista, will not survive through restriction. It just won't. Mm -hmm. People aren't going back to 1953. Women aren't going to go back to 1953, right? And so what happens is when you, when you have a movement that is in power, that is catering to a radicalized minority willing to use violence against the multicultural majority, both at home and abroad, which is why I'm very worried. At the same time, I never give up. Uh, the if you're telling me to give it up, you're telling me to be a cynic and apathetic and tap out. Uh, I can't afford to do that. I have children and my children will ask and our children will ask, what did you do against income inequality, climate change, fascism? And you know, I'll say, oh, I did nothing because it was too hard. And they're like, oh, thanks, dad. Thanks for being apathetic and useless. I'm glad you tapped out. I'm glad the only inheritance you gave me is suffering and you're now telling me to suffer well. And so you never know what will happen in America. It's always been two steps forward, one steps back. But we have to recognize the threat and we have to mobilize. And the majority has to mobilize uh, for an imperfect but nonetheless functioning multiracial democracy where all of our kids, inshallah, can still dream and become a co-protagonist. Mm. That's um, just my opinion. That's not Krista's opinion. That's just my opinion. <laughs> I want to make sure she doesn't get in trouble. <laughs> um. I'm happy to risk getting in trouble being up here on the screen with you. Um, <laughs> here's a question. Have you ever been criticized for not doing enough for your community? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I get. So I'm apparently being boycotted by my like my communities. There's no such thing as a Muslim community. Uh, how come you haven't tweeted about this issue? How come you haven't written an article about that? Oh, I see you're promoting your book. How come you don't promote what's happening? You know, because there's so many. Unfortunately, you know, I was thinking about writing this article next week about it's good to be an anti-Muslim bigot, <laughs> you know, kind of tongue in cheek, because if you look at Muslims around the world, right, you have a genocide and uh, the Rohingya genocide that no one talks about in Myanmar. Yeah. You have the Uyghur Muslims being crushed. And unfortunately, people are attacking China and they talk about Uyghurs, not because they, they like Muslims, but because they want ammunition to attack China. But they're being crushed. You see what's happening in India, where the leading party, the BJP, just just a couple of days ago, Krista, the leading party from its account had this cartoon showing like a bunch of Muslim men being hung. And you're like, what? This is the BJP account. And that tweet was deleted, right? And you're seeing in Israel, uh, you know, increasingly moving right wing uh, you, with, with the occupation of the Palestinian territories. You're seeing in Europe, anti-refugee, which means anti-Muslim. You're seeing in America, the open Islamophobia, right? And S Syria, Afghanistan, no one talks about. Everyone's talking about it, but no one's talking about the humanitarian crisis, Yemen. Yeah. And you feel overwhelmed. You feel overwhelmed. Yeah. And now you have Ukraine and you have the pandemic and you have climate change and you have income inequality and you're just trying to survive. And yeah. so, you know, after a while, you're like, you, you, what you say is, okay, I can only be myself. I'm not the ambassador anymore of 1.7 billion people. Uh, I have limited time and I'll, I can only, I can only choose to tell certain stories. And, you know, that's the conflict. Is it my role or my duty to represent all people? Can I be selfish and tell a story? Yeah. You know, and, and, and I'm telling you the post 9-11 generation, many of us felt that was our role. We had to be the Muslim firemen. We had to be the Muslim Wikipedia. Okay. It gets exhausting. You lose so much time. Uh, it often hurts your mental health and spiritual health. You, you, you're you like fighting multiple fires. You can't put out even one and you lose something in the process. I did lose something in the process. I, I might've lost some of my imagination, my creativity, my time, the space that's needed for mm -hmm. fiction, a novel, you know, wit, mirth. So uh, to answer the question, yes, I get it. But now I have tougher skin and I'm like, there's only so much I can do. And oh yeah, by the way, I got three kids. So I gotta take care of them as well. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, near the end of the book, you 
Let me just find this. You talk about, it, this kind of follows on what you said, what you, some of the things you've been saying. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very strange and dramatically hard moment to be alive, right? It's this very, there's lots of catastrophic aspects to being, to this time in the life of the world. It's not the whole story, but, and here we are, right? You, you and I, when we, the Commonwealth Club, when they extended this invitation, when we were looking forward to this, we had no idea that a war would have, new war would have started in mm. Europe yesterday. Um, um, and I, I feel like you have, I mean, you, you, I feel like you started walking into this, but I'd like us to kind of walk out of this conversation on, on this subject of hope. And um, where is it you talk about, I'm just looking at my notes, you know, that Islam is a, one of the things you've written about um, in recent years is your daughter's cancer and mm. um, this, this, uh, and she's, she is better now, but um, that, that um, experience of um, struggle and, uh, and pain and um, mortality yeah. in your child. And I feel like you've, uh, I know that you have, you have worked with that as a way also to, to, to reckon with what hope means to you. And there's a place where you talk about investing in hope, mm. um, that language in that you choose to invest in hope and, and Islam is also, um, something of a guide in this for you. And I wonder if you'd say a little bit more about that. Yeah. So the last chapter of the book is called Invest in Hope, a Tire Camel First. <laughs> it's based on this beautiful saying <laughs> in Islam that yeah, says, sorry, have faith in... good. fill it out. Fill in yeah, the it's, it says, have faith in God and tire camel first. And another fairy says, have faith in God, but tire camel first, which means you do everything within your power that you can with your hands to fix your situation, right? Tie your camel in the desert, all right? Use your akhal, your, your intellect, your common sense. And then even then, if you've tied your camel and done everything, and then the camel wanders off and you're stuck in a sandstorm and you see the end, you're like, listen, I leave it to God. I've did everything I could. And so what that says, and there's another saying that I mentioned in the book is, um, uh, is that, and it's also in Judaism, that in Judaism, it says, if you even if you see the Messiah plant a seed in Islam, the Prophet Muhammad said that even if you see the day of judgment coming around the corner, plant the seed, which means God commands you to have hope and plant that seed, that seed that might turn into a tree that gives shade or bears fruit for future generations, even if you see the end coming. And when it comes to my daughter, eight months before the pandemic, uh, she was diagnosed with stage four cancer all over her liver. She needed a, a, a brand new liver. And there were moments in that journey, Krista, and you know about this, where she, we didn't know if she'd survive. And every complication happened. And after my kids used to sleep, I used to stay at night. And like Dr. Strange from the Infinity War with the Time Stone, I used to just imagine every narrative. And I used to, because I'm a father, I have, you know, my wife was pregnant at that time. My, I had a son and I'm like, she might not make it. And I have to, be a father. I can't just stop because as Frost says, life, it goes on. And so I imagine every scenario, I imagine burying my daughter. I imagine calling the grandparents because I had to, I had to emotionally prepare. And I remember I settled on a narrative where she somehow survives and she gets a full liver transplant and, and things work out and she becomes negative for cancer and her hair grows back and she bounces around with her chirpy smile. And I chose to invest in that narrative. And lo and behold, Sean Zahir, who once was an anonymous donor, a man who had never met her, decided to give a piece of his liver so a girl could live. Over 500 strangers, most of whom I'd never met, decided to sign up to be liver donors, including people who told me, I hate all your politics. I hate everything you've tweeted, but yeah. I'm praying for your daughter. And what that showed me was people still have the capacity and the willingness to be good and do good. Sometimes some people change. And the story is still being written. There's no the end yet. And sometimes in life, all you have, Krista, is that the hope that when you turn the page, it brings with it a plot twist and a better story. And so having survived literally a pandemic as we're talking to each other, seeing my daughter, who is right in the next room, go through three costume changes a day, chirping around, and tomorrow we find out, cross our fingers, inshallah, if she gets antibodies to the shot, 
Mm. How can I then not be hopeful? Mm. How can I then tell you to be cynical? My daughter should be dead. I should be dead. And yet here I am talking to you. And so we have to invest in hope and we have to invest in joy, almost like building a muscle. You make the intention and you steal those moments in the day, however you can, to actively flex that muscle, especially in these moments of hopelessness. You need hope. Well, Waj, um, congratulations on this book and thank, thank you, you for this book. I'm glad you're here. Um, <laughs> I'm glad to be here with you. Thank you so much to the Commonwealth Club for bringing us together, for making this possible. Um, and I, I think you've left us, um, I think that those words of investing in hope and investing in joy and building those muscles are uh, gifts to take into these days ahead. So thank you. Thank you so much. Honor to, to share the stage with you. And thanks so much for taking the time. And thanks to everybody who's with us and will be with us in the amazing time shift that will happen once this has an eternal life online. <laughs> Inshallah, as we say. Inshallah. <laughs>